Hi, it's Chris Watkin here, and I'm joined by a gentleman known by many of you, a chap called Andy Holstead, who is the CEO of the Barbon Group. You might know them better as Homelet and Let Alliance. These guys do over 1.1 million tenant references uh, a year, which represent nearly half a million properties that they get referenced. They um, have rent guarantee insurance uh, liability of up to £1.25 billion. So these guys are really heavily involved in the rental market. Um, whenever you talk about Home Let or Let Alliance, um, there's an awful lot of love for these guys in the industry. And uh, their boss, Andy Holstead, is joining me today on the Watkins sofa. And in this video, Andy, I'd like to, uh, this is the first of a number of videos I'd like to do with you, but I'd like to find out a bit more about you and your story, your origin story. Is that okay? It is, yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming down to Grantham. I'm... Andy, um, you left school at 16 years old. I did. Okay, but it's obvious that you're a bit of a grafter. D did you do any work before then? Yes, uh, just, just I'm, I'm known as an exaggerator, Chris, so I've got to put you right. We'll do about a million references this year. Okay. 1.2, probably next, but uh, that, there's a bit of work to do there. Um, yes, I started work when I was 12. Okay. Um, I got my work ethic from my dad, who, who still is a grafter in his 80s. Um, I started uh, life on a milk round before school and milking cows after school. So it was all, um, all work for me. I, I've always enjoyed working. And, um, what line of business was your dad in? Uh, my dad was an engineer, a welder and a turner. Yeah, so okay. he really did earn his money. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what did your mum do? Mum was a nurse. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you learnt hard work from your dad, what did you learn from your mum? Oh, kindness. And uh, I was brought, we, we weren't brought up with money, but we were brought up with love, and that gives you confidence. And, Whereabouts um, was home? Rochdale. Okay. So I'm a Rochdale boy. Yeah. On you the can, other side of the Pennines. You, uh, you can take the boy out of Rochdale. <laughs> but you can't take Rochdale out of the boy. <laughs> There's some truth okay. in that. Yeah. So you're 12 years old, you were on a milk round. Uh, delivering, were you also milking cows? As yeah, well? yeah. I used to do both, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, and what did, what did uh, having a job at such a young age teach you? Well, I, I like the money, so I like being able to buy things that perhaps my mates couldn't have. I always remember having a smart Wrangler denim jacket and things like that that um, I was able to, I was able to afford. So that's why I did it um, unashamedly. Yeah. What did it teach you as well? Um, it, well, it taught me that hard work brings rewards. Um, that if you really want something and you want to work for it, you can have it, albeit in those days very small, but nonetheless. Um, and also, you know, I've just grown up to believe that hard work is a virtue. It's a good thing. It looks after you. Um, how well did you do at school? Um, not, not great. Um, I went to school for sport, really. Love football, basketball, athletics. That's why I really went to school. Um, I, I made some great friendships with a couple of teachers that were life-changing for me. Um, but I was a very basic, all-level kind of student and at 16 I couldn't wait to get out. Uh, o levels boys and girls for anyone who <laughs> yes. is uh, in, in their 40s or younger are the old GCSEs. That's, that's correct. Yeah. Good stuff. So you decided not to do A levels or, or college you went into work. Yeah, yeah I got a job um, I went I went for some interview experience of all things I was advised to do that and uh, went to the TSB bank for interview experience and got offered a job. There you go. So, so you yeah. interviewed well. So um, that was my first real job, although I was also part-time DJ, um, even came across Peter, Peter Stringfell in wow. my younger years. But um, yeah, um, my, my, I was a bank clerk and I did that for a few years and I absolutely loved it. So, so basically you were spinning discs at night yep. and, and then you were putting discs of coins in well, the till. Well, the great thing about working in a bank in those days, you finished at 3.30. Wow. So in the afternoon, so I was able to go home, have a kip, get ready, and then go out in the evening and, um, and was, do, do DJing. Yeah. Was the DJing there again just the way, just as almost as a side hustle to earn a bit more money? Well, it was good for girls, and okay. uh, in those days I was very young, and it was, um, it was good for money. So yeah, it was social life and also great way to earn extra cash. So um, you found 
your wife. Mm -hmm. Was she, was she at the disco or? Uh, no, we, well, we, we actually did meet at a disco, but that's uh, way back now in 19, we got married in 1984. Okay, so when did, what, what's the name of your wife? Dawn. Dawn, and when did you meet her, roughly? Um, well, about four, about four years before then, so it would have been in 1980. 1980, okay. And you decided to settle down and buy a house and get married and yep. what, what, you know, because let's be honest, how old were you in 1980? Uh, well, I was born in 1961, so 19. Okay. okay. Isn't it, isn't it strange, and again, a lot of the younger guys, boys and girls watching this, is that in the 80s, you tended to buy your first house. Well, that's, that's how I got my first real sales job. So um, I had a good job at the TSB, and certainly my mum and dad thought it was a great job working in a bank, given my background. And um, the man from the Prue called round to sort out my life insurance and all that kind of stuff. This is just as about you were about to get married? Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is in 1984. And, uh, in so you and Dawn got married, bought your first little terraced house. And the same month, I changed jobs and moved to the Prue. Is, was there a coincidence of the man from the Prue coming round? Yeah, and... yeah, exactly that. He offered me a job. Yeah. Okay. So he came round to sort out our life insurance and offered me a job. Because those are the days of endowments and things that's like right. that. Yeah, and collecting life insurance on people's doorsteps. That's, that's what I did. Never drove past anyone at a bus stop on my on my area, I always gave them a lift and figured out whether or not they needed any extra life insurance. So you went the extra mile. When did yeah. you realise that that was a technique that worked? Oh, working in the bank. So, you know, just, just talking to people and asking them if they're having a nice day meant such a difference, you know, and um, picking okay. people up at the well, bus stop and you, running Did them. you learn that from your parents or just...? Yeah, I guess I did. I guess I did. Um, and also, you know, just, uh, I, I guess I've always been a sociable type of person in that regard. Was it a genuine reason of asking how they were? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah, genuine. I mean, there was nothing in it for me in the TSB. You didn't get paid extra for being nice to people. It just made the day go quicker, to be perfectly honest. But you realised by being genuinely interested in the person, they became interested in you and then the, yeah, therefore yeah. you were able to... So then you would speak to them about a different kind of bank account and it was incredible how easy it was to do that. And then by going to the Prue and spot, did you spot, did you, did you just pick up clients? That's <laughs> that awful, isn't it? <laughs> were you stopping at so, bus stops, so, uh, people look, you recognise? I mean, we're going back a long time now, aren't we? We're, yes, we're in the 1980s. Um, there were no mobile phones. There was no internet. There was none of that. And I had a particular territory that was allocated to me. It was sort of postcode allocated. And every house on that territory was mine in terms of the opportunity for me to sell life insurance to people in that area and um, well you got to know everyone really because it was quite a small area very working class uh, part of Rochdale um, a very large council estate and I just took it upon myself don't drive past the bus stop pick up the person at the bus stop have a chat to them they're on your territory they won't be going far so it's hardly it's hardly an inconvenience and it was amazing how much business I, you, I picked up by doing that by going the extra mile, well, by taking them the extra well, mile. Well, taking them in that instance, yeah. Okay, so how was life in the Prue at this point? You just got married? Got married, um, couldn't believe my pay slips. I thought they were misprints, if I'm really honest. I mean, it was just, it was a license to print money in those days. Um, and I pursued a, a, an amazing career at the Prue. Um, some of the what, best years of my life. What were you spending your money on? A uh, house. Okay. Um, nice things, cars, that kind of thing, just lifestyle and just really enjoying it. But also, um, I was ambitious and the Prue gave me the opportunity to grow. So you rose and, up through the Yeah, ranks. and uh, you know, um, yeah, exactly that. And that's where I met my mentor. That's where I met, outside of, uh, of my father and my family, the most influential man that I've ever met in my life, a guy called Terry Shrimpton, who um, was the sales director. And uh, he came out to visit me in one of our branches in, in those days. And um, the rest is history. He picked me up from that point and became a mentor. And uh, we, we became lifelong friends and he's still a very close friend now. What did he teach you? Well, he, was, he, was, he, he taught me the value of listening in sales. So I guess for, well, he taught me two things. One. If you work harder than everyone else, strangely, you'll be more successful than everyone else. That was, a f But I knew that already. The second thing he, he, he really told me was, if you listen, then your customer will tell you what they want. If you listen for long enough, they'll tell you. 
And then if you're smart enough, you'll be able to turn that into what it is that you're trying to provide them with. Um, but, it, but he was just one of those people that he caught my imagination. He inspired me to do things that I thought I could never do. And um, a great man, a great man. But you weren't at the Prue forever, were you? No, and the, I, I moved on from the Prue to the Pearl as the sales director. What did Trevor, what did Trevor do? Did it Terry, Terry, Terry. Sorry. Well, he moved first and took me with him. Ah. So that's how I went. I mean, I would, I would never have left the guy, ever. Um, there was a personal loyalty there that went beyond any kind of brand or any kind of organisation. Is he older than you? Or? Yeah, yeah, he's in, he's in his 80s now. Okay. And, um, but still, still well, still good, lives, lives part of his life in France, or he did pre-COVID. Um, but I went with him, so he, he went to the Pearl and asked me to go with him, and, that's, and I, I didn't even have to think for a second. You weren't scared? No, not, not remotely, no. no. And, um, so why do you think he went to the Pearl? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I guess some of it would have been money driven. Uh, maybe, maybe he'd just done his time at the Prue. You know, mm. I mean, um, I was at the Prue twelve years. Terry was there probably eight. So you know, sometimes you just need to make okay. a move to to achieve what you want to achieve. Okay, so you you joined the Pearl in '95. Yeah. Um, did everything go okay? Yeah, we had a, we had seven amazing years, amazing years, and um, excuse me. Um, we probably would have stayed there for good, but there was a very significant event in that the AMP business, the Australian business, was the owners of Pearl Assurance in those days, they decided to divest in the UK. And it was obvious, the writing was on the wall, that the, the, the days of huge sales forces in the life insurance industry in the UK were over. So it was time to move on. Terry, Terry sort of moved into semi-retirement and uh, I was lucky enough to be headhunted by AIG in the States. Yeah, they're the people that uh, used to uh, sponsor Man United, weren't we they? We did, yeah. Good stuff. Um, How was that? It was, an, it was a wonderful experience. It's the first time I've worked internationally. I travelled all over the world uh, with AIG. Um, it was based in, in the US. Um, it didn't work out because it became a condition really that I moved my family to the States and that was never going to happen. Um, especially I wasn't there very often, I was travelling. Um, so it, 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 it so would Dawn be part and, of company. Dawn and the, how many kids have you got? Four children, yeah. They were um, all, had you got them all by this point? Yeah, all four, yeah. 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 So, so really at the end of the day, there was no point in moving them over to America no. because well, all I their friends there. and you would Well, you would they, they all had the network, had parents and all the rest of it. But... But I wasn't there either. I was traveling all the time, so it would have been just wrong. So I came back and... Um, how, did you, how did you cope with being away a lot with your family? I, I, I routed all my travel via Manchester, so I, I came home all the time, as, as often as I could. But it was tough, actually. And that was probably the most difficult two years, um, being away for extended periods. Because I know one of your sons is, is Jordan, who actually runs the... the he runs yeah. his, estate, the, the, his own estate netting agency. Do you think it made him a stronger person with you backwards and forwards? In some ways, and in other ways, I think he would say that it wasn't the best time for him. Four how, sisters. How old was Sorry, he? Sorry, three sisters. How old is he at this point? Uh, well, what's Jordan now? He's, uh, Jordan's 30 now, so you know he was in his teens, and it would have been... It was... Yeah, it's not yeah. easy for him. You know, right. he used to be on the phone saying... Dad, when you come in home, you know. Okay. Is he the youngest or oldest or so in the middle? So he's our second. So I, okay. I have um, what do you three, three daughters. What do your other daughters do? My eldest daughter is a midwife, Melissa. Okay. She's 32. And the Jordan. And Sophie, who is 27. I better get this right, haven't I? You're better. Um, and Sophie has her own beautician and spa business and doing really well. So another entrepreneur. Yeah, she is. And she's, she's, she's doing terrific, actually. And then my youngest daughter, Ellie, she's 25. And she's a PE teacher, first class hockey player and PE teacher, doing brilliant. Lovely. Yeah. It's funny how they've almost, two have gone into more of a social setting. Yeah, yeah. Probably more like their mum. And, and you brought two more to... And, and two went to university and um, two left school early to get on with, um, with careers. So, yeah, quite, quite different. So you kind of fell into, my understanding, around 2003, 2004, you kind of fell into just like a, a job in contract working for Homelet. And now we're getting into... Uh, it, it's amazing in business, isn't it, how, how, how you develop a network and how that can look after you uh, in times when you need it to. And um, 
I came back from AIG, I didn't have a job. And um, I got a call from a chap called John Honeyset, who was you know, very well known in, in the home let business. And um, more, more recently set up Rent For Sure uh, that we've acquired recently, we'll perhaps come on to that. But um, John called me and said, look, I, I hear you're back and you, you know, would you do a job for me? I want you to launch something, or launch a product or a service. I had nothing else to do and I was glad of the work. So I said, yeah, that would be terrific. So I did. And that's how I got involved in the home let business. And um, as a consequence of doing that contract, ended up running the company for four years. So that was between 2003, 2007? Yeah, exactly that. What did you enjoy about running a, let's be honest, a, you know, you're in short, home let, you know, before you were almost, you were selling products to punters, people, now you're selling products to letting agents. Yeah, so it was my first move into business to business type mm -hmm. environment. Uh, if I'm honest, I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, do you think anyone does? What? Know what they're doing? Well, I think I feel, I feel like I do now. But um, <laughs> I, I was sort of learning a lot about an industry that I knew very little about. Did you ever suffer from imposter syndrome? <sighs> no, I don't think so. But I. I was conscious that I was being asked to lead a business that I wasn't a specialist in. Do you think that's important? I actually do, yeah. I okay. really do. I really you were good do. at selling. Yes, um, but I'm not, I'm not a person that believes that you can just switch on and sell anything that you choose. Okay. I really, you know, and this is just a personal view, I accept other people might think differently. But to really sell something, it, it, I, I, I honestly believe you need to believe in what it is that you're selling. I agree with you on that. I think you need to understand it. I think you need to understand how it's made up and how it benefits the customer. So um, I don't think you can switch from selling life insurance on a Monday to selling aircrafts on a Tuesday. It doesn't work like that. How did you learn? Whilst, so, how did you learn this whilst running the firm? Because, you know, your, your job as the boss is to, is to drive it the is. business forward. I mean, there is a degree of sort of making it up as you go along almost. And, but also what I um, did and still do is spend as much time as possible with people who are actually dealing with customers all day long. You mean so, actually the boss is talking with the, with the front All line? day long, yeah. So, you know, I sit on the phones, make phone calls myself, listen to those calls, do customer visits. Uh, in fact, probably did too many customer visits, weren't in the office enough. But the, uh, and, and, and if you do that, then you learn about the business quickly. You know, the best decision makers in business for me are those that talk to customers. 2007 came along. You left Homelet. I why, did. Why is that? So um, the parent company um, got into a little difficulty and I was approached to move to an insurance consolidator called Tarragate. Uh, many people have heard of Tarragate. Um, cut a long story short, the idea was that we would um, hopefully acquire the home let bring business, bring it into the Tarragate stable and uh, it would be a safe haven. Um, the plan was terrific, but 2008 happened credit and crunch. the credit crunch affected many businesses. Tarragate was certainly affected. It wasn't possible to pull that uh, acquisition off. I was left with it as an expensive person without portfolio in many ways and ended up out of work. And uh, that was probably the lowest point of my professional life in that um, I really wasn't sure what to do. And we were in the eye of the crisis of the uh, credit storm, it was horrendous. 2007, 46 years old, used to the good life. And a big spender. So all my children went to a really good school. Um, I've always enjoyed nice materialistic type things. So, you know, um, I've always been a good earner, but I've matched it with spending. There is a saying that people's expenditure tends to rise in line with their income. Mm. And I'd never, had a, I'd never had a big payday, so I'd never had a successful sort of share deal or equity deal. That, you, that was almost like a nest egg that you could sit on. Never done it. Just, just made, made a lot of capital for others, I suspect, but earned very well on, on my own okay. journey. I'm not complaining about it. When you that. found that out, how did you feel? Wasn't sure what to do um, and thought that, look, this is a turning point. Either get back into another corporate job, and I really didn't like it. Um, I'd, lost, I'd lost my mentor in the corporate world that, that used to free me up to be able to operate the way I wanted to operate. And uh, I just didn't want to be a grown-up in a corporate world. It wasn't, it wasn't my thing. Okay. 
okay, but what I mean, what did Dawn say to this when you know, you know, you've got your kids in fancy schools, you've got yeah, I, I tend to separate the thing out. I tend not to take those sorts of things home and but you get on surely with that. You can't, surely you can't, you know, if you've got no money coming in, it's not as if you can come home and be sweetness and light. And well, no, but I didn't have no money coming in. In that I were doing, um, I picked up some contract work here and there, and okay. and what have you. Um, we also, I also owned a lettings business at this time, that um, did help. There was a re actually there was okay. a very good help. Um, that's the business that my son now owns and runs. Um, so look, we got through, but it was it was very difficult, and that's that's the moment when I decided, do it for yourself because then no one can take it away. Do you think you falling down the well, and hitting rock bottom, even though there was a bit of money coming in, but has made you the man you are today? Yeah, I mean it was rock bottom. I, I was very stressed and very concerned about how I was going to pay my way. Um, and there is no doubt, had that not have happened, then the success wouldn't have happened either. There is no doubt. It, it, you know, I, I think when you're fo really forced to do something, when you're really in a crisis, and you have significant responsibilities, like four kids, um, you get off your backside and you do something about it, yeah. What happened next? Why did you, you, did you just decide, shit, I'm going to do this, I'm going to set up my own business and set up that all. Yeah, I knew, I, knew, I knew quite a lot about it by this time and um, we'd done some interesting things in our lettings business like we'd, um, we'd set up a, a, a proposition called Rent on Time and what have you. Um, and I work with some amazing people that I've worked with for many, many years. And um, I got that group together and we said, right, shall we do something? And we decided to do it. And four of us set off on the Letter Lions journey 10 years ago. Well, 12 years ago now, but 10 years leading up to the first sale. And um, we, we, we just had amazing success. We worked hard, but the business, um, the proposition was sound. And our success followed much faster than I ever dreamed of. Now, let's not bore the people to death too much about the acquisitions and the reverse mergers, but basically what happened is over the last 12 years, you have kind of merged and demerged. And So, well, the, the, story, the story is really straightforward. Um, the, the first deal that we did was um, a merger with Barbon, the yes. Homelet brand. Um, I knew Martin Totti, the CEO of Barbon at the time, and uh, we met and discussed the opportunity. Martin was looking for an exit and so were his team. Um, so he saw the, the opportunity of the deal to be a way for him to be able to get out of the business that he'd been in for seven, seven years, by the way, and his team also. Um, but also they needed a growth engine. Let Alliance is a growth machine. Um, Barbon was and, and is a very well established high market share business that was struggling to grow. So you put the two things together and we, we got a whole number of benefits. Um, and that's exactly what we did. And actually, we would have, Martin would have exited the business a year sooner, but for COVID. We did the deal on uh, 5th of November 2019. We were then planning very early in 2020 for me to take over, Martin and his team to leave. And COVID struck. So we said, we can't do this because we're now moving into a world that none of us understand. So Martin stayed on to run Homelet. I carried on running Let Alliance. And we did that for the best part of a year to steer this organization through, through, through probably the most difficult experience of my working life. So th throughout this, you, you know, you've been a major shareholder in all this. And whilst you're still an equity, you have obviously released some equity. And in essence, you and the people behind you turned something from nothing to a 25 million pound business in 10 to 12 years. Uh, in 10 years, yeah. 10 years. Yeah. So what I'd just like to just finally touch on, therefore, is what you've learned from those 10 years, how you've run your business, because mergers and acquisitions, I want to talk about staff, the importance of customer service, bringing customers with you, because if you don't mind me saying, you've got an awful lot of loyalty from the estate and letting it, well, letting agency industry, yeah, you letting have, haven't you? Yeah, and, you know, if you're doing one, one million uh, references, which in essence works out at 400,000 properties, that is a massive chunk yeah. of the private rental market. 
Yeah. We, 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 are, we are a successful business and we, we have an amazing customer base. Look, my, my, yeah. my, view, my view is this, that if you build a business that is, that's core values are looking after every single team member that you have in that business and every single customer as if they are the only customer you have, then success and profits will follow. And when we set out on that journey, you know, people would say, well, that's nice to think, but, you know, will it really happen? Well, the answer is yes, it did, it does, and I've been proved right. So, you know, fundamental to our business is looking after our people and their customers are always right. Okay, let's look at that. Let's, let's look at staff first. Yeah. Okay, I was going to treat this in a separate video, but I'm, I'm enjoy really enjoying this. So I want to, if you don't mind, sure. let's, let's go down that rabbit sure. hole. What would your advice be? to A, su surround yourself with senior members of staff, and then also the, 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 you know, the frontline shop uh, sh soldiers, I can never pronounce that word, um, to ensure that you're all singing off the same hymn sheet and driving in the same direction. Well, I think, I think first of all, you know, if you're going to lead a business, um, work with some really good people around you who are prepared to disagree with you um, on a regular basis as they see fit. Um, get everybody in the same canoe, you know, paddling in the same direction. So share the spoils, make sure that the rewards are shared and that um, when, when, when the business does well, then everybody in the business does well. And, and you know, that was a, a real philosophy for us. Is, is that come from you or does that come from others? Is it that... comes from me and the, and the three people okay. that set the business up with me. And COVID, how did that test the values and and beliefs of, of, well, of the business well, inc and well, staff. Yeah, incredibly so, and a huge challenge. Um, because the other fundamental belief that I have is that the customers are always right, that you find a way to satisfy the customers even when they're being difficult. And um, yeah, so COVID struck, and the truth is when you're carrying a, a north of a billion pounds of rent guarantee. That was squeaky um, bum to um, it? Well, we didn't know what to do. Um, we literally didn't know what to do because um, never before have we been faced in a, in a, in a, with a challenge that said, look, you know, people across the UK might not be able to pay the rent. I mean, that's never happened before. Um, and it did happen. Um, so true to our values, what we didn't do was carry on regardless and start to become inventive about ways where we might not need to pay claims or put clauses into rent guarantees that um, might suggest under certain circumstances claims wouldn't need to be paid. We didn't do any of that. What we did was reflect and thought, right, we are going to lose some money here. And that's what insurance is for. At times of crisis, the insurance company pays out. But what we're going to have to figure out quickly is at what price can you run this product for in this world? And I'm not sure there is a price. And, and how long will it last? I absolutely believed that the people of the UK would ultimately pay the rent because they always do. And if they didn't, they'd lose the homes and that this would only go on for a particular period of time. Um, again, on that one, I've been proved right in that the, the worst fears of rent arrears and, and what have you didn't come true. Um, legislation was introduced that, that encouraged landlords and tenants to talk and negotiate, which was a very positive thing. And we got fully engaged with that. And we've come out of the crisis at the other end um, intact. Our customers are intact and we're able to and continue to be able to offer to protect the businesses. Did it surprise you that, that there was a government report recently that, that basically when you actually drill down and look at the numbers, that if a, if a landlord was self-managing their property, they were 272.5% more likely... <laughs> Right. Well, I wouldn't know about that percentage, but what I would say is any, land being any landlord out there self-managing property, unless it's done on a professional basis, in which case you're a pseudo agent anyway, they're insane. They're insane. There is only one way to do this, and that is appoint a professional letting agent to look after your portfolio. That, those Why would you not? Those are the stats. Yeah, I'm not surprised. 272 and a half percent yeah, more likely to yeah. be two months or more in arrears. Yeah, and the, the the work that letting agents do is just incredible. The press, 
politicians, shelter, all these types of organizations are very quick to criticize the letting agent marketplace, don't know what they're saying. I know I've got live examples of agents on Christmas Eve delivering things to properties because they've been, the tenant's been let down with something or other. The amount of care and attention that letting agents provide to their customers is incredible. That's what should be reported in the press. Um, much, much more. Bad news sells newspapers. Yeah, it does. But the vast, vast majority of letting agents in the UK are highly professional people who do an amazing job. Let's come on and talk about your relationship with, with agents. You, you, you're you very proud of the fact that you 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 said earlier on that you share the successes with your staff. You you were very very you know when we were talking before the videos got switched on that you share the income with agents as well. Yeah. What's what, why is that important to you? Well, our customers are letting agents. The fact that we deal with hundreds of thousands of landlords and tenants. Well, we only do that because of our relationship with letting agents. So we don't drive any revenue into our organization that isn't shared with our customers. This year we'll pay four million pounds plus of commission back to letting agents on products that we sell on their behalf. Do you think you'd still probably sell the same amount if you didn't pay them the commission? Um, no, um, because sales, it, sa sales is about a process. If you're good at selling, you're good at process, which is counterintuitive. Most people think selling is all about personality and, and all the rest of it. The best salespeople in the world, number one, they're busy, and number two, they follow a process. What I've learned over the years, the letting agents are not great at selling, per se. They are too busy running their lettings business. If they wanted to be an insurance broker, they would have been an insurance broker. So we do a whole chunk of sales on their behalf. Now, that only really works when the letting agent is motivated to be involved in the process. So if the agent is motivated to mention to one of their tenants, look, you're going to get a call off on let, or you're going to get a call off let alliance to discuss insurance, please take the call, it's in your interest to do so. That has an enormous effect on the conversion rates that my sales team has on, uh, on, on making the sales. So. Absolutely, the agent should be paid because the whole thing is successful because the agent's engaged. We wouldn't exist without agents. That's as simple as that. What's the future of Barbon Home Let, let Alone? Um, well, we, we recently we, um, we did the successful acquisition of Rent For Sure, which welcomes uh, Tim and Luke and the team there to Barbon. Fantastic business. Um, probably got better IT than uh, we had in Let Alliance or Home Let, so we're learning quite a bit about, about their platform and how we can move that across, uh, more of what they do across the whole organization. Um, we'll do more acquisitions. We, you know, we are now part of the PIB group, um, one of the most successful consolidators in the UK insurance marketplace. But I have this brilliant relationship with Brendan, who is the CEO of PIB, who understands that Barbon is not a typical insurance business. We are a tenant referencing business that happens to do insurance. And he understands that. So that, that allows us to grow in the marketplace for non-insurance related business. You see almost Terry Mark too. No, no, no. We have a very different kind of relationship. We've met much later in life. You know, I'm nearly 60. I know it doesn't, I know it doesn't look like that. Um, and so, no, it's quite different. But um, what I do have with Brendan is a brilliant business relationship where he understands our business and I respect him. He's a man that I've met who, when he says something, he does it. Does he almost does he recognise the fact that you're not maverick, but you're a little bit different, a bit a square peg in a round hole? So just kind of let you get on with it. Yes, yes he does because he's the he's similar. Um, he's quite maverick too. But no, I think he what he what he recognises is we've got a great business. It operates in a particular sector, serving a particular set of customers, and therefore has particular needs. So we ha we do not have a vanilla approach to anything. Okay. Do you still think you'll be working in the business in ten years' time? I don't know. Um, I, I, retirement's a bizarre thing for me. I, I, I mean, I'm in this wonderful position now where I work because I want to. Um, and um, 
Retirement's a bizarre concept because I'm not sure what I'd do waking up in the morning and not having any, or not having a purpose. Well, I'm sure you won't want to go into Dawn's feet too much. <laughs> no, and uh, I wouldn't. But I think um, if my health holds up, then and I can continue to add value, then I'll continue to work one way or another. Andy, thank you for your time today. Uh, I've learnt a lot. Uh, I hope the boys and girls out there in a state letting agency have learnt a lot. Yeah, I well, hope it's been some interest. And um, what I'd like to do in some separate, shorter videos is talk about the relationship between the state and letting agents and, and, and uh, suppliers, technology and cheap or inexpensive referencing. But we'll do those in separate videos. Is that okay? Look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you.